This week on Q&A, Robert Gordon, professor of economics at Northwestern University. Professor Gordon discusses his book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth, looking at the growth in the American standard of living between 1870 and 1970, and whether we'll ever see anything like it again. Professor Robert J. Gordon, author of The Rise and Fall of American Growth, 750 pages of a lot of statistics, and I read this in your book. Another less familiar problem is that we may be creating too much data. What do you mean by that? I didn't mean uh, that we're creating too much data uh, is in the context of big data and artificial intelligence. Uh, most of that is being used for marketing. Uh, most of the big data that's actually being used by corporations is to steal market share away from each other. Uh, that's not producing productivity or social benefits. It's just uh, carving up a zero-sum pie. Where did you get the idea? When did you get the idea for this book? Well, the original idea uh, of rapid economic growth in the middle of the 20th century, slower growth before and after, uh, came about when I was a graduate student many years ago uh, when some new uh, work on the history of the American economy came up with some startling numbers. And that is that the output, the total production of goods and services in the U.S. economy, doubled between 19, the 1920s and the 1950s, and yet the amount of capital that was used to produce goods and services didn't increase at all. And that violated all the theories of economic growth that said that output and capital uh, should rise together. So I immediately started wondering what was going on. And in fact, I did my PhD thesis in my 20s on could we be measuring the capital wrong? Did we get something wrong in the data? And I found partial evidence that we had. Uh, but that was the beginning of the idea, that there was just something special about U.S. economic growth. And the book expands that to the notion that there is a special century between 1870 and 1970 when we achieved growth through inventions that were so broad-based across the scope of human activity that we can never do it again and we'd never done it before. What do you think is the most important invention back in those many days ago? Well, you can't, the, the great thing about the special century is you can't play that game. You can't single out one invention. We had electricity, which made possible elevators, the dense New York kind of city. Uh, it made possible portable machine tools. It made possible floor standing electric tools. It made possible air conditioning. And then we had the internal combustion engine uh, that made possible not just autos, trucks, buses, but also indirectly it made possible air transport and the complete elimination of time as a barrier that it used to be uh, back in 1870. But you can't just stop with electricity and the internal combustion engine. We had the end of isolation with the telephone, radio, phonograph, motion pictures, television. We had the uh, complete change in the daily routine of housewives who no longer had to carry pails of water into the house. They were able to turn the tap on running water. Almost nothing among the single inventions is more important in its daily usefulness than running water. And together with that, at the same time, uh, we developed waste disposal, so you no longer had to carry the dirty water out of the house. And then think about health. In 1890, 22% of newborn babies died within the first year of birth. By 1950, that was down from 22% to 1%. So I can't choose a single invention. I've got electricity, internal combustion engine, running water, health. Uh, that's a, just take it all together. It's more than just the effect of the computer on modern society that we've enjoyed for the last uh, 25 or 30 years. Your family, your parents were involved in economics in some way? Both my parents got PhDs in economics from Harvard in the 1930s. Uh, my father was very lucky. 
uh, in the very depressed job market of the 1930s that he was asked to teach summer school at Berkeley at the University of California in the summer of 1937. He did well enough so that he was asked back and he spent his entire career as a professor in the economics department at the University of California at Berkeley which uh, certainly for a substantial time during that interval was one of the top five economics departments in the country. They had something in those days that was reflective of anti-female discrimination. They were called nepotism laws. There was a rule that only one member of a family could be in each department. So that meant that my mother, who had an equally good Harvard PhD, could never be a professor in the economics department that my father was. And so she played the dutiful role of the uh, second uh, in the family, and she had a number of uh, positions in research organizations around the fringes of the university, but was never uh, in the uh, center of the university as a full-time tenured faculty member as he was. What about your brother? Well, you funny thing you mentioned my brother. Uh, our family became somewhat notorious uh, because of the connection with Cambridge, Massachusetts. As I mentioned, my father and mother both have PhDs in economics from Harvard. Uh, so did my brother, who was younger. Uh, I was the black sheep of the family. I went down the river and got my PhD in economics from MIT. But the uh, whole idea of all four of us getting our PhDs uh, in economics in Cambridge, Massachusetts was sufficiently alluring to Business Week that they ran a story in 1973 called The Flying Walendas of Economics. <laughs> so what's the difference between the way you think about economics and say your brother? Well my brother was a uh, self-avowed radical Marxist. Uh, my brother would make Bernie Sanders look tame uh, <laughs> and uh, indeed in uh, the early 1970s, when my brother was in his late 20s, he did a book of readings in which he had introductions to the different parts of the readings. One was the capitalist big business vision. Then he had the liberal vision. And then he had the true vision. And it was almost like Marx's Cuba. Uh, in fact, he held out Cuba as a paragon of how societies should develop. Uh, I think he tempered his ideas uh, later. He, be he came to uh, see the failures of the Soviet Union and Eastern European communism as an economic system. But I remember I was washing dishes with him at my parents' home in uh, 1990, uh, shortly after the fall of communism. And he sort of looked at me and cynically asked, well, I guess you're pretty happy about this fall of communism, as if he wasn't. <laughs> Why uh, and how were your views different than his? He was a victim of the Vietnam War, not in life and body, uh, but rather in spirit. Uh, he was just enough younger than I was, that while I was free from the Vietnam draft and could go to graduate school without any kind of compromises, uh, he had to change his career ambitions in order to stay out of the Vietnam draft. He did not want to be a conscientious objector and flee to Canada. Uh, and so those were tough times for people in their early 20s. Um, and he became a radical protester against the U.S. government in involvement in Vietnam very early on in 1964 and 1965. In retrospect, I was quiet and passive and didn't have much to say about it. Um, I admire him in retrospect for being able to express his views. And as a result, uh, they colored his views of how economies should behave. He became very much anti-big business, anti-capitalism, very much focused on uh, how society can help those in poverty and uh, needing help. How did your views differ if they did uh, with your parents? My views were very similar to my parents. My parents were what I used to call knee-jerk New Deal liberals, supporters of Roosevelt, supporters of Truman, uh, I remember 
uh, at age seven in 1947 when uh, the Taft-Hartley Act was passed by the Republican Congress uh, that made it possible for states to become right-to-work states, denying unions the full ability to organize. And I remember how much my father uh, was incensed by that. Uh, and this was the beginning of the retreat from the New Deal. Uh, I'm very much uh, supported liberal, progressive, what we now call progressive uh, uh, policies. Um, I think, as I express in the uh, postscript to the book, there are a number of policies that we should adopt that raise taxes on the very lucky people who are in the top 1% of the income distribution. I think we should have higher taxes on those who are uh, make more than a million and more than 10 million uh, per year. We should have uh, radical tax reform that gets rid of most tax credits and deductions that give uh, advantages to incentivize people, for instance, to have larger houses than they need by through the mortgage interest deduction. Uh, and so I have a fairly uh, progressive uh, middle, I would call it middle left wing uh, view of economic policy. Uh, I differ with uh, Senator Sanders on uh, several issues while not overtly supporting uh, Secretary Clinton. Uh, in particular, I think it's simply too late for the United States to adopt a single payer medical care system. We've had uh, decades of Medicare incentives to make our whole medical care system more expensive. We pay 18% of GDP on our med medical care system and for all that money we get life expectancy that's about at the bottom of the top developed countries. And so I think it's just simply too late. Uh, there's no way you can destroy the entire private health insurance industry or no way you can take over bloated health providers in hospitals and group practices around the country and suddenly impose on them the kind of rules that in Canada and the UK keep medical care costs so much more moderate. You say in the early part of your book that you had 15 research uh, students to help you put this book together. Go Stretch, back. Stretched over a good 10 years. That's what I wanted to ask you though. Go back to the beginning of all this and what were you researching and did you know you have strong views did you make up your mind ahead of time how the outcome of this book would be or did you learn as you went well you know the book starts out in 1870 and the first half of it covers 1870 to 1940 and it's divided up uh, into uh, food the the basic necessities there's a chapter on food and clothing then there's a chapter on uh, housing and the uh, invention of electricity and the uh, end of the isolation of the house. You know, in 1870, uh, your standard dwelling was completely isolated from the rest of the world. By 1940, only 70 years later, almost every house in urban America was connected five different ways with electricity, gas, telephone, running water, and waste disposal. So, uh, all of those things needed to be researched. Cha the next chapter is on transportation and the gradual evolution away from the urban horse uh, to uh, electric streetcars, to motorized buses, to motor transport, and all the things that it made possible, like personal travel, motels, supermarkets. Uh, so how does one research something like that? Uh, I used an average of, I would guess, 40 different books, mainly in those older periods, uh, books about uh, individual topics. One of my favorite books was called Horses at Work. Another book was called Living Conditions in Victorian America. Uh, and uh, one of my favorite uh, books uh, was called uh, Nature's Metropolis, Chicago and the Great West, the ways in which Chicago was intertwined with the prairie states in taking timber from Wisconsin, sawing it up into wood, sending it out to make fences for the prairies. The, wood, the meat and the cattle would come back to the Chicago stockyards and be sent on uh, to the East Coast. Uh, it was a stack of books, and the research assistants helped find the books. 
They stuck it, them full of post-its with interesting passages, but I found I pretty much ignored their post-its because the books were so fascinating. And I would read, and I would take them, and I would start quoting them and paraphrasing them and gradually stitch together this intricate web. Uh, if anybody uh, has a common reaction to the book, it's the first half of it is really fascinating. Most people tell me they just didn't have any idea of the level at which people uh, lived. And one of my favorite quotes, which is in the book, and you know, it's still a mystery to me how I found this fabulous quote, but it is uh, valid, that in 1885, the average North Carolina housewife walked 148 miles a year carrying 35 tons of water. Now that evokes the hardship of being a housewife and all that water that was carried into the house because of the lack of faucets and running water, all that water carried into the house for bathing, for uh, other uh, functions, for cooking, all of it had to be carried out. Uh, and just think of the backbreaking work it was to be a housewife in those days. How many years have you been at Northwestern University and what have you taught? I have been there since 1973, so we're up to about 43 years. Um, and in the first half of that period, uh, I taught graduate elementary uh, macroeconomics. Uh, I'm not an economic historian by profession, uh, so I've never taught economic history, even though obviously I'm very interested in it. Um, and I've always taught uh, elementary economics to freshmen. I've taught intermediate economics to juniors and sophomores. And I have my favorite course, uh, which delights, I think, from the teaching evaluations, I can say that. Um, a freshman seminar taught to 15 students on the topics did economics win the two world wars? And that, of course, is economic history. It's about the role of economics in World War I and World War II. Um, and one of the most fascinating topics to me, which is, um, comes alive in chapter 16 of the book, is the role of World War II and, to a lesser extent, government policies in the Great Depression for bringing about this epical acceleration of U.S. economic growth in the middle of the 20th century. I want to come back to that in just a second, but um, how would you characterize your findings in this book at the end? And if you're a young person in your class, somebody puts their hand up and says, Professor, what's my life going to be like? How much change is there going to be? How much growth is there going to be compared to the years that you wrote about since 1870? I would start by saying that, roughly speaking, since 1870, each succeeding generation has achieved double the standard of living of their parents, and that is in measured GDP, measured output. Of course, the benefits of running water, the benefits of reduced infant mortality are not counted in GDP, so the idea of doubling is actually an understatement of the improvements that people have enjoyed. That's been true of every generation up to the last generation. The current young people, the so-called millennials, will be the first generation who fail, on average, to double their parents' standard of living. And we're seeing the symptoms of this now. We're seeing a decline in marriage. We're seeing student debt. We're seeing a delay in household formation, a delay in marriage a delay in having children, um, and uh, the young people are uh, struggling. 40% uh, of U.S. college graduates are unable to find jobs that require a college education. 50% of those who complete law school never do find a job that requires a law degree. And so we have this terrible situation of indebted with student debt, baristas, taxi drivers, people in menial jobs who have blighted their lifetime financial future uh, through college debt. And somehow we need to come up with a different system. Uh, in the book, I recommend repayment of college loans that are contingent on income. You only repay to the extent that you benefit 
from your college education and get a job requiring a college education. That's called income contingent loan repayment. It's well established in Australia, it's well established in Britain. So if you were a young person, you came out of college, you had student debt, and you suffered from a spell of unemployment, you would not be expected to repay any of your debt during your period of unemployment. Or if you were a young person and you were attracted by a low paying job in social service, uh, helping people out, say in a nonprofit organization, you would repay less of your student loans uh, because uh, you would be only uh, required to repay them in proportion to your income. Northwestern's an expensive school. Uh, yeah. And as you stand in the classroom and look out at your students and know this, how does it make you feel that looking out there to half your students in that class may not be able to find a job that uh, paid 60 grand a year? Well, the problem is really not with Northwestern and the elite schools like Harvard and Princeton and Yale. More and more they're making it possible for students to go through uh, without substantial student debt by giving them very generous scholarships. Uh, most of the elite schools have uh, very large endowments and they are investing their endowments in uh, student aid. Northwestern has just announced a major program uh, to further reduce the student uh, burden of debt. It's the lesser universities, it's the state universities, it's the smaller, less prominent private universities where the problem is. And the further you go down in the level of academic prestige, the more likely the students coming out are likely uh, to find that they can't uh, locate a job requiring a college education. What's your philosophy of teaching? My philosophy of teaching is to bring together the real world with the abstract and dry textbook material that shows them how to shift curves and solve equations in macroeconomics. Probably alone among my colleagues, I put together course packets for both my intermediate and my principles of economics course that contain clippings from The Economist, from The Wall Street Journal, from The New York Times, showing in many cases how ordinary people are caught in the impact of the overall economy. I have a wonderful uh, Wall Street Journal clipping from 2009 written at the absolute bottom of the recession called uh, The Smith Family experiences the recession. And it's a classic example of how the textbook multiplier works, but it's in terms of a real life family chronicled by the Wall Street Journal. Uh, the father loses his job, they're a lucky family because the mother keeps her job, and in the end the way they adjust is that the father starts doing the, the child care, and they uh, take their children out of the child care facility and like other parents doing the same the child care facility has to lay people off they stop going out to restaurants and the restaurant has to lay people off it's a wonderful story that illustrates the uh, impact of the multiplier the dry textbook uh, concept so that's my way of uh, dealing with the real world in my freshman seminar uh, we just had our last class on monday and i showed them uh, a series of videos from a BBC series called The World at War, done in 1971. And it showed people uh, coping with Germany on the home front in 1941 to 1945, inside the Soviet Union and inside the United States, with rationing, with the shortage of rubber, with the uh, incredible feats of production that were accomplished. Uh, so uh, it's the real world and blending it together with the concepts that they have to learn to pass the exams is my philosophy of teaching. Go back to the first part of this book and what first? What was the first uh, invention that really mattered that changed people's lives? You know, you're talking about everything from electricity to telephone to uh, railroads. Well, you, you need to go back way before uh, the 19th century to things like eyeglasses, which were uh, enormously important, um, and uh, simple devices to measure. Uh, the printing press has often been called the most important invention of all time uh, by uh, eliminating the need to hand transcribe uh, documents and bring 
information to a much broader uh, audience. Uh, but if we limit ourselves to the so-called industrial revolutions, the first industrial revolution that, uh, where the inventions took place in the late 18th century included the steam engine and its offshoots, the railroad and steam ships, and together with that, cotton spinning and the development of manufacturing based on what essentially was mass production of cotton fabric and cotton thread. Uh, then uh, we had the telegraph, uh, which was in 1844, before the beginning of this book, which starts in 1870. Uh, so we'd already moved beyond the limitation of the speed of travel. Before 1820, the speed of travel was limited by the hoof of the horses and the sail of the sailboats. We went on from the hoof to the railroad, from the sailboats to the steamships, and after 1870, we got this great uh, span of inventions that I mentioned before. How much of it, and you mentioned lots of names in here, including Macy and Montgomery Ward and Richard Sears and all these people, how much of the progress was made because somebody was a leader? Oh, well, uh, uh, what, what interests me is how many of the great inventions of the late 19th century were done by individuals working by themselves, not working for big corporations. Uh, there was, a, in a way, a U-shaped history of innovation with the uh, role of individuals, very high at the beginning, Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, George Westinghouse, and all the individual inventors. Uh, Carl Benz, the inventor of the first really workable internal combustion engine. And of course the Wright brothers with airplanes. These were all independent entrepreneurs. Then we went into the 20th century and during most of the 20th century we had a diminished role of individuals and an increased role uh, of corporations. Then the individual came back in the late 19th century uh, late 20th century with Bill Gates, Microsoft, Steve Jobs, Apple, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, and uh, we had a return of the role of the individual uh, inventor. What do you think of the stock market? And what impact does that have on making money, building things, incentives, inventions? Well, the stock market is an essential tool of uh, the modern economy, uh, and it allows uh, people who have innovative ideas uh, to obtain the funding to build the plants and equipment and put their ideas into fruition. Uh, the stock market is also a source of great wealth and a source of some of the income inequality that we have between the top 1% uh, and the rest of the people. Uh, we've had a shift uh, starting in the 1990s in the way chief executive officers are compensated. Much of their compensation now it takes the form of stock options uh, where they're rewarded if their stock price goes up. And this has helped to explain uh, one of the reasons why American chief executive officers are so much more highly compensated than those in other countries. Is that good or bad? I think there's very little you can do about it. I don't want the government meddling in the rewards of chief executives, but we do have the option of raising taxes to take back for society some of the good luck that these people have had. I think you said in the book at some point there were eight million horses in this country. Oh, there were, more, there were more than that. You mean at the turn of the century, yes. back in yes. the late 19th century. Uh, I think it was more like 27 million at some point. Uh, and uh, gradually uh, the need for horses uh, was reduced, not just by automobiles and trucks, but by tractors. The need for horses on the farm began to decline radically in the 1930s. Uh, it was not until the 1930s that they figured out how to make a rubber tire big enough to fit on a tractor. And 
uh, starting in the 1930s and 1940s, you had an almost complete replacement of horses as the work animals on farms. I do believe uh, in one of my books on horses, I read that in the decade after World War II, we had something like a horse holocaust, that the horses were no longer needed, and we didn't get rid of them in a very pretty way. So you mentioned in the book, you talk about how the Germans were more effective in, in uh, starting with the, com the uh, internal combustion engine, Why, and that the Americans, though, invented almost everything else uh, in the industrial, that first industrial uh, revolution. Why? What, what was it about the Germans, the, the Benz and the, the other names? Uh, the Germans had always been very good at mechanical uh, engineering. The Germans. Uh, led the chemical industries, the invention of new chemicals in the late 19th century. Um, I'm not sure that I have a, a great explanation of why some countries are better than others, uh, why the French are better at food and perfume uh, than, the, uh, than the Germans are. Uh, but the interesting thing is that the auto industry was really taken over by the Americans and it was partly due to the genius of Henry Ford and his invention of the assembly line. You know the price of a Model T Ford started out in 1908 at $950 of the dollars of that time and by 1923 it had fallen down to $265. Imagine being able to buy a car for about one-tenth of annual income. You can't buy a car today for one-tenth of the average income. Uh, so. Uh, we had a genius at production. He happened to be in the United States. Uh, and we had, of course, a very large country uh, with lots of rural roads, uh, lots of farmers who were isolated. Um, and unlike electricity, which reached the farm late after World War II, the motor vehicle reached the farm very soon among the first users of cars before urban workers were the farmers who of course saw all of the benefits in being able to be in communication with the nearby small town. How were the roads changed from dirt to concrete or asphalt? Well it, it changed in phases. Uh, we got the first basic paving of roads in the first two decades of the automobile in the period between 1900 and 1920. Then the federal highway system uh, started and we had the uh, roads, old US-1, uh, US-99 on the west coast, US-101 uh, were numbered and built in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, then of course we had the interstate highway system uh, that was primarily built between the mid-1950s and the mid-1970s. What about water mains and simple things, not simple things, important things like sewers? Well of course they were not new inventions. Uh, moving water had been around since the Romans. Uh, and uh, what was new in the late 19th century was the dedication of individual cities to putting the investment in. It was like the rest of society was creating wealth and creating income and uh, became rich enough so that cities could say, okay, we're going to tax you to build water mains and sewage pipes and that's not a new invention, but it's something we can afford to do now. And it's amazing how fast it all came together between 1880 and about 1940. When was there electric refrigeration? The first electric refrigerators were invented around 1915. Uh, by 1940, roughly half of American households had an electric refrigerator. What did they have before then? They had an icebox. Even the icebox wasn't invented until the 1880s. So the icebox had a rain uh, with the daily or periodic delivery of ice by the Iceman um, of only about 50 years, between about 1880 and 1930. And then we moved on to the electric refrigerator. And the washing machine was simultaneous with the refrigerator. Uh, by, by World War II, by about 1940, roughly half the uh, families in the United States had some form of washing machine, but many of those had a ringer rather than an automatic spinning dry cycle. Why do I remember early in my life an ice man coming to the and having a big pick? He picked up a huge block of ice. What would he do with that? Did he 
Well, if it, if you had a house like mine, there was a separate door in the back where the ice was uh, inserted from the outside without compromising the security of the house. Uh, and uh, the uh, ice then sat in a uh, often elaborately carved wooden box, uh, which was then uh, cold enough to keep food preserved for uh, if not the length of time we now use a refrigerator, at least for a substantial period of time. When did clothing change? Well, the big revolution in clothing was that in 1870, women made their own clothing, including that for their daughters. In fact, the typical week of a farm family would involve laundry on Monday, hanging the clothes out on Tuesday, uh, maybe baking on Wednesday, and then uh, sewing and making clothes on Thursday and Friday. It was only after about 1920 that clothing became reasonable and cheap enough and people became well enough off to uh, have the average woman go out and buy clothes. And I must say that two of the great inventions in the late 19th century, which don't get enough attention, although they certainly do in the book, are the invention of the modern department store with all the variety of goods and services provided at reasonable prices, and the Sears, Boat, Roebuck, and Montgomery Ward catalogs, uh, which uh, made open the full panoply of American manufacturing to rural households and allowed them to buy things that previously they'd had to make or do without. What role did the government have, 1870 on, well, in, in fostering growth? The government had an enormous role. First of all, uh, the government allocated land for the railroads uh, and provided incentives for the railroads to build out uh, in many cases, people think excessively. We had too many different lines running across the country from east to west. Um, and the incentive was land grants. The railroad companies were given the right to develop the land uh, for a substantial number of miles around their uh, new lines that they built. Uh, we had free land through the Homestead Act of 1862, where uh, people who wanted to go out and settle uh, areas in the West that had previously not been settled uh, were given free land by the government. The government set up agricultural research stations. The government subsidized state universities. All the big state universities of the Midwest, the University of Michigan, Missouri, Illinois, Iowa, were all made possible by land grants either from the federal government or the state governments in the late 19th century. Well, as you know, state governments used to spend a lot more money on state institutions of learning and education, and now that number is often down as low as 15 percent. Why did that change? It's part of the general tightening of budgets. It's a change in political philosophy. Uh, the uh, state university uh, has been one of the great American institutions that's achieved uh, epical increase in college completion rates, uh, and we've had a uh, general political turning away from government, not only at the federal level, but at the state and local level, uh, so that we've had austerity. We've all heard about austerity being part of the reason why Europe is in a continued recession, but we've had our own brand of austerity, both in the federal government since 2012 and in the state and local governments uh, throughout the period since the recession. Part of it's due to the fact that state governments can't run deficits. They're forced to run balanced budgets. And so when their revenues decline as a result of the Great Recession, uh, they cut back, but they have not yet restated what they cut. I have to say that one of the things that brought a smile to my face is when I read about the frozen food and a man named Clarence Birdseye, because we grew up knowing about you buy frozen food named Birdseye. Who was he? Well, he was a man who had a clever idea. It was way ahead of its time because he first managed to freeze food in 1916. Uh, but if you can imagine an early refrigerator, it just had an ice box in the middle. That ice box was not capable of maintaining a zero degree temperature. In the early post-war years, uh, I did a study of 
uh, appliances. And it wasn't until about 1960 that your average refrigerator could reliably maintain a freezer temperature of zero degrees. So I'd say that Mr. Bird's eye was about uh, 40 years ahead of his time in terms of the feasibility of his invention changing everyday life. What about the bathing tub? Well, that was uh, one of those things that surprises a lot of people about how people lived back in the late 19th century. This was true not only on farms, but also in urban uh, houses and apartments. The only source of heat uh, in many houses was the open hearth fireplace. And so uh, to bathe, you had an open tub uh, that was movable that you could move in and out of the kitchen. And uh, there was no modesty. Uh, members of the family would uh, very infrequently, certainly not every day, uh, get into the tub. Water would be carried from the kettles warming the water over the open hearth fireplace and poured into the tub uh, to get the right temperature of water and then people would step into the tub. Uh, it was only after about 1910 uh, that we began to have indoor bathrooms with bathtubs. Uh, and only by 1940 uh, did a majority of American houses come equipped with bathrooms as well as running water. What about the flush toilet? Well, that's the same, same chronology. Uh, in the late 19th century, you went out to the outhouse, uh, and it was the arrival of running water together with waste disposal that made possible the indoor bathroom. So the indoor bathroom was a package. The toilet and the bathtub uh, came together at the same time, often being installed in houses as soon as they could get the running water that was essential for the operation of the whole thing. What's the history of the health care? The history of health care is that uh, it was extremely primitive. Uh, hospitals were uh, dirty, f feted, uh, unsanitary places. Uh, we only had the invention of antiseptics to keep people clean in the 1880s. We only had anesthetics to deaden the pain of operations about the same time in the 1880s. Uh, so uh, we had a gradual professionalization of medical care, both hospitals and doctors, uh, in the period between about 1870 and 1920. By the 1920s, we had pretty much gotten to a professional stage of medicine where people went to medical school. Medical schools were quack organizations in the late 19th century, and a man named Flexner wrote a famous report which damned the education at existing medical schools and completely reformed the education of doctors and hospitals. When was the peak of uh, medical invention? And, and do we expect much more? Well, medical invention, I would say, reached its peak in the 1940s with the invention of penicillin and antibiotics. By 1970, uh, we had identified smoking as a source of both cancer and heart disease. Um, we had uh, identified uh, chemotherapy and radiation as cures for cancer. So I would say that the core period for reaching the level of modern medicine was between about 1940 and 1980. Uh, we've been making very slow progress since then. And much of the improvement in health, remember, was the curing of infectious diseases, was things like cleaning up the water and getting rid of diphtheria and other kinds of uh, uh, infectious diseases uh, back in the 19th century. That was the key to curing infant mortality, was uh, the conquest of infectious diseases. So as you're teaching, do you teach this in, in class? Not yet. It may come. What do you think the reaction of young people should be to these, this history and the future, what you see? I think young people are so wedded to their smartphones and so wedded to uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, that their imaginations are not broad enough to realize how much they can take for granted, how much has been invented that benefits the way they uh, behave in everyday life. Every night when they plug their smartphones in and recharge them, they're beneficiaries of electricity. Uh, one thing that uh, often uh, 
interest people is the impact of Superstorm Sandy on the East Coast uh, back in 2012. That wiped out the 20th century for many people. The elevators no longer worked in New York. The electricity stopped. You couldn't charge your cell phones. You couldn't pump gas into your car because the, uh, it required electricity to pump the gas. Uh, so uh, the power of electricity in the internal combustion engine to make modern life possible is something that people take for granted. And I'm not sure I can convince them that it's more important than the latest YouTube video. Do, do you have any thoughts about if you were uh, just starting out in college today, what would be your best major? Joint major in economics and computer science. Why? Because I think the ability to program computers opens up a new world of possibilities of, uh, of types of study that are no longer formidable and the study of economics uh, helps us understand the real world and its limitations. You talk about in your book headwinds and you list workforce education inequality among other things. Talk about headwinds. Well the uh, much of what we've been discussing so far is the slowing pace of innovation. I'm not saying that inventions are over, I'm not saying the technical change is over, but the pace of it is more measured than it has been uh, over the last uh, century and a half. Uh, when I look out into the future, I'm projecting a growth rate of output per hour, our productivity, at about 1.2 percent per year. It's a little bit less than the average of the last 40 years, leaving out the great revival of productivity growth that was temporary, that occurred in the dot-com era of the late 1990s. So productivity growth of 1.2 percent, that's not what people, the median person is going to be able to attain. And that's for two reasons. First reason is the population is aging. As people move from work into retirement, the number of hours worked in society per member of the population obviously goes down. That means that output per person is growing slower than output per hour or productivity. So my 1.2 percent growth in the future of productivity is diminished by the aging population to 0 0.8 for average output per person. But then we have inequality. Over the last 30 years, about half of this gain in income has been going to the top 1%. All the rest of the bottom 99% is sharing the other half of the extra income. And that means that the growth available for the median middle person in output per person or income per person is going to be another 0.4 deducted. So I went from 1.2 for productivity 0.8 for average income per person, 0.4 for median income per person, and that doesn't even cope with the fiscal headwind, which was the fact that the Social Security and Medicare trust funds are running out of money and will have to either cut benefits or raise taxes. Isn't this a happy conversation? Aren't you glad you came together today with such an optimist? How, well, but how, how much are you worried about the $19 trillion deficit? Debt, I mean, not deficit. We always express the deficit uh, the debt as a ratio to GDP. We have an $18 trillion GDP, a $19 trillion deficit. Much of that is held inside the government um, and in the Social Security Trust Fund and is a growing percentage of our debt is held by the Federal Reserve as a counterpart of its quantitative easing that attempts to uh, stimulate the economy. So I'm not worried that the United States has too much debt. The rest of the world seems very eager to buy U.S. government bonds. And the minute the Federal Reserve shows any inclination of raising interest rates, money flows in from the rest of the world. Uh, so we have considerable latitude. But you know, we don't have to worry about raising deficits to spend money on things like infrastructure to, to repair our uh, tainted water systems, our crumbling bridges and highways. We have the ability to put higher taxes on the very richest people. We have the ability to get rid of tax deductions and loopholes. There's a lot of money that can be gained from tax reform to repair the American system. We've had political paralysis. It's been a good three decades since we've had any substantial tax reform back in the 1980s. So the deficit is the last of my worries. 
What makes you the slightest bit optimistic that a future government will be able to change the tax code? I'm not in charge of being optimistic about political paralysis. I'm there, like many economists, to propose what is possible. And if the po political divide in the United States uh, between the Democrats and the Republicans uh, paralyzes uh, decisive action, uh, that's their fault. Uh, all we can do is point in the direction that they're supposed to follow. If they fail to follow it, too bad. Have you ever been an advisor to a president? Uh, not directly. I've never been a member of the Council of Economic Advisors. I've been on various government advisory committees, but not directly to the president. Go back to your family. What was it like having four PhDs sitting around a table, all a member of the same family? Did, did you ever try to outthink the other person? Or Well, of course, we uh, didn't all have PhDs uh, until my brother got his in uh, 1969, by which time I was almost 30. Uh, much more memorable, I think, were the ways in which uh, economics influenced me and my brother uh, at an earlier age. I remember once the uh, 1963, the unemployment rate went up from 5.5 to 5.6 percent. We wouldn't consider that very high, and we wouldn't consider that even a significant change now. My father actually winced when he heard that news. He was so sensitive to the level of the unemployment rate. He was so out to help the poor and the disadvantaged. Um, and I think my brother and I uh, picked that up. My brother took it much further in his leftward march toward Marxism uh, than I did. But I think we both uh, uh, absorbed a lot of my parents' deep feelings about politics. What was the most uh, I don't know if the word is fun, but the, when you really enjoyed writing this book, where did what did you learn that surprised you? Oh, I loved writing about the horses. Uh, one of my favorite books, uh, which I acknowledge in the preface to the book, uh, is called Horses at Work. Uh, it talks about how in uh, 1872, uh, an epidemic of horse influenza uh, spread across the northeastern cities and brought life almost completely to a halt. Most people would have thought that because the railroad had been invented by that time, somehow steam engines would have propelled people around the inside of cities. But indeed, steam engines only moved railroads between terminals uh, intercity, not intracity. We still had horse-drawn buses, we had still had horse-drawn streetcars as of uh, 1872. Uh, and learning about that, also learning about Victorian uh, houses, about the uh, parlors, about the kitchens, about the servants. Uh, it was almost like a revisiting of uh, upstairs, downstairs, or Downton Abbey uh, to a lesser extent. Uh, so that was my favorite part of the, uh, the book to read. I loved criticizing Jacob Riss, the great uh, muckraker uh, who called attention to the horrible indignities of the New York tenements. Uh, and I, by looking up statistics, was able to show that hardly anybody outside of New York lived in tenement situations like those that he was decrying. Uh, so it's learning about the old days and being able to write it up in a way that is compelling to people. That was the greatest joy of writing the book. Why have union membership figures gone down? Well, partly it's politics. Remember, uh, we had the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947 uh, that made it possible for states to pass right-to-work laws uh, that uh, eliminated the automatic nature of union uh, recruitment. Uh, and we now have more than half the states with right-to-work laws. So uh, the political system interfered in the ability of unions. The other main reason is uh, the combination of automation and globalization uh, that has gradually eroded manufacturing jobs. Manufacturing was the uh, heartland 
of unionization. And we've had machines replacing workers. We've had imports replacing domestic manufacturing. We've had outsourcing of plants, the famous Oreo cookie factory in Chicago that Donald Trump uh, decries when they're moving the production to Mexico. Uh, those are good union jobs that are being destroyed in Chicago uh, as we speak. Are you uh, for or against these trade agreements, NAFTA uh, and, and the Pacific Trade Agreement? Well, deep in the blood of any card-carrying economist is a belief in free trade. But uh, the uh, effect of imports has clearly created an enormous number of social problems, especially in the Rust Belt, with the decay of manufacturing and the elimination of good blue-collar jobs. Uh, I'm not sure what the solution to that is, um, because even with uh, tariffs and elimination of uh, completely free trade, you would still have an awful lot of imports. So the dedication of this book is for Julie, who knows our love is here to stay. Tell us about Julie before we close this down. Well, first of all, our love is here to stay is a, uh, the last song that George Gershwin wrote uh, in 1937, so there is a uh, whole story uh, to that. Julie is a Harvard PhD in English, another PhD in our uh, our family, uh, and she has had a lifetime of uh, a career in teaching English literature. She teaches films, uh, even at uh, Northwestern, uh, and even today she runs a course in film adaptation. On top of that, she's a very talented portrait artist. And so she's off on Monday to take her portrait art class, often with the model so impressed with her art that the model comes over and takes pictures. Uh, and uh, then on Wednesday, she's off to her film adaptation class where they see a film uh, one week, read the book, and then talk about how the book was adapted uh, into films. And she's been doing that now for 12 consecutive semesters. Where'd you meet her? Met her through a Harvard roommate uh, who had dated her in high school. Uh, and uh, the roommate went out of town and I took over. <laughs> are there uh, children in the Gordon family? No, there are not children. That was our choice. So it's lots of PhDs, and mom and dad, I assume, aren't with us any longer. How about your brother? Is he still alive? No, my brother died, unfortunately, of a uh, disease of the heart muscle back uh, just 20 years ago, uh, next week. And how long will you keep teaching? As long as I can walk into the classroom, and as long as my voice holds out. Our guest has been Robert J. Gordon. The name of the book is The Rise and Fall of American Growth, and we thank you very much, sir. Delighted to be here. transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qnda.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.